Um, we are going to talk all about, well, we're going to talk about an introduction to septic arthritis. Um, should take us, I reckon, uh, about 20, 25 minutes, um, which could give us some plenty of time to um, answer questions that you may have. If you want to return to this recording, um, then I will put it on my YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow, unless it um, gets sorted really quickly. Then I might get it up there tonight. Um, but if you don't follow my YouTube channel, then please do. Um, just type Rheumatology Physio into YouTube and I do come up. There's plenty more webinars just like this one. Um, so let's get started with septic arthritis. So our agenda we, we got long enough uh, webinar to have an agenda really but um, I fancied um, being silly on the first slide so here we go um, so we're going to talk about septic what is that then we're going to say septic with what what are the infections that might occur in joints septic where um, what does it mean it looks septic and uh, you've decided that it might be septic what do we do now now what um, so we're going to try and cover all of that in the next 25 minutes hopefully give you a good grounding and understanding about what is happening with a potentially infected joint we're always a bit concerned about infected joints they're a red flag um, and um, yeah not very not a very uh, good thing to occur in our patients really so first thing I'm doing and do, we're just going to cover quickly what the features of inflammation are. And I cover this slide in all of my rheumatology teaching <coughs> um, and talk about inflammation. We're usually fairly, um, as physiotherapists, osteopathic chiropractors, MSK professionals, fairly au fait with the fact features of inflammation. And the way that I normally teach this slide is that the typical features of inflammation if you have an injury, are pain, heat, redness, and swelling in various different levels. So you'll have seen injuries um, and uh, musculoskeletal injuries with varying levels of pain, heat, redness, swelling. You might see a lot of pain, might not see a lot of swelling. You might see loads of swelling, not that much pain. These things do vary in between. Um, and then what I normally then go on to say is about systemic features of inflammation which typically include things like stiffness um, night pain better with activity not improved by rest and better with anti-inflammatories now when we talk about septic arthritis um, what we see is a bit less of the systemic features of inflammation a lot more of the typical so we see a lot of pain we see a lot of heat a lot of redness and a lot of swelling and um, you might hear things like it looks like an angry joint. It looks like a septic joint. It looks very inflamed. Uh, lots of inflama local inflammatory process going on, but not necessarily so much of a systemic process going on. It will get joint stiffness. Um, it will get some night pain, but not necessarily in the same levels or the same regularity. Also not necessarily going to see the same response to activity and rest. You quite often will see it again aggravated by activity and rest it doesn't really improve with anything if i'm honest um, and then this night pain the waking in the second half of the night is very typical with something like rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis etc whereas with the inflamed joint the the septic joint it really just has no 24-hour pattern to it it's really quite aggravated and angry because of course the infection is going round and round um, within that joint and it isn't necessarily settling at any point um, anti-inflammatories often will not touch it so obviously with the with the septic joint you are causing a local inflammation a high grade local inflammation or acute inflammation um, but the anti-inflammatories often are not sufficient to settle that in any meaningful fashion um, so you often don't see a significant improvement with anti-inflammatories but um, those are the features of inflammation that we are likely to see but you, as I mentioned we are going to see a very red very hot very swollen very angry looking joint um, and with quite a lot of pain as well so um, the what is septic arthritis here we go let's get into sort of the bones of this and it and really try and na nail it down so this is a type of joint arthritis it's not the same as something like rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis so this is not driven by a fault of the immune system so it's not an autoimmune condition like those are 
Um, so in those diseases, what you have, you're out, your inflammatory system, part of your immune system, starts to not recognize tissues of the joint, um, and then it starts to react against the tissues of the joint. So in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, against the synovium or the tenosynovium. Now in septic arthritis, obviously what we are getting is an infection in the joint space, um, and then you are getting an, an immune reaction against that infection as much as you would in any other situation with regards to an infection. So your, your immune system is trying to fight that infection and that causes a very high grade local inflammatory reaction. Now, joint spaces are homeostatic. So within the joint itself, it's normally kept in homeostasis. So when you get an infection in there, you get a very collected amount of inflammatory reaction because it's kept within the joint. or it's, And then it will spill out of the joint and cause other problems. So you, so you see the redness, but you get this real concentration of inflammatory reaction within the joint. So you get this intra-articular swelling and this real angry um, joint because it collects within there um, and that causes a big problem leave that alone and what will start to happen is very very fast joint destruction because of this high grade inflammation um, it will also as other infections do if it's not um, sorted out in with any speed is it then can become systemically problematic um, and you get things like um, general sepsis obviously a really big problem so we do need to deal with these things very quickly from those point of views but also it's really awful for the patients they're really unhappy um, very very painful as we mentioned F um, function real a real struggle um, and they're really it's going to be really pretty bad for them so we do need to deal with it pretty quickly the other difference here between um, septic arthritis and other types of arthritis particularly in rheumatology this is typically monoarthritic, so we're looking at one single joint. So like I mentioned, you've got this homeostatic um, joint space. You get an infection set in in there, and it pretty much stays there um, within that joint area. And this is usually a large joint, most commonly the knee, um, but it can be the hip or the elbow or the ankle. Those are the most likely places. You can technically get it in any joint, um, but it's usually a large joint, most commonly large. Um, and as we talked about, this is an orthopedic emergency um, and we want orthopedics to deal with this. So typically um, with obviously some sort of antibiotics, um, draining the knee, all sorts of different bits, but they need to make the diagnosis obviously first. They need to understand what is causing the infection and also to um, treat it um, appropriately from that point of view but of course when we have this real red hot angry um, significantly inf inflamed knee or joint then we need to rule out other medical emergencies or orthopedic emergencies as well such as fractures um, or intraarticular bleeds or other even more potentially sinister causes for um, these really severe symptoms so it is an orthopedic emergency um, we aren't going to be referring anywhere else so accident emergency or triage clinic for orthopedics off they go to there let them sort it out um, and um, away they go and as we'll see in a in, in a slide or so's time commonly this will be after surgery anyway so they may well already be under an orthopedic team and that's something that they will be well versed with dealing with now the good news is this is pretty rare septic arthritis is uncommon we're not likely to see a lot of it the problem is obviously as we've mentioned when it does occur it is a, a real emergency we need to deal with it so um, approximately two to six out of a hundred thousand in the UK you're obviously going to see higher levels of it if you're in some kind of disaster zone um, but um, in the UK two to six out of a hundred so a uh, hundred thousand sorry so very small numbers of people are going to get this and actually we can narrow it down to specific cohorts of people that are much more likely to get it so in your general day-to-day -day clinic you know, if you think about a general musculoskeletal clinic, someone coming in with knee pain, it is extremely unlikely they're going to have septic arthritis. But once you narrow it down, as we mentioned, post-surgical as an example, or even in the cohort I work with, the inflammatory patients with real destructed joints, um, it is more likely um, to occur in a damaged joint. So 
Um, certain cohorts of patients slightly more likely, but still fairly rare. So that is good news. Um, but we do obviously want to be able to recognize it when it occurs. Oh, just had a, there we go. So what is it likely to be infected by? Um, so the most common um, type of infections are um, the, you know, I'm going to butcher some of the pronunciations on this because you know, look at how they spell um, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. They're the most common types of um, sept, uh, infection to cause a septic arthritis. We'll also see um, gonorrhea causing a septic arthritis. So that's going to be in your young sexually active adults. And typically there is usually about a two week delay here on um, these um, sexually transmitted infections. Um, so you would have the exposure to the sexually transmitted infection. And then two weeks later, then you get the, um, the arthritis kicking in similar sort of time frame to a reactive arthritis. The difference being with reactive arthritis, that would more likely mimic something um, like a rheumatological arthritis, like a rheumatoid or a spondyloarthritis, um, and be quite low grade comparative to a direct infection of the joint, which as we mentioned is gonna be high grade, uh, but about that two week point. Um, so it is important that if we have got this red hot angry joint that we need to be asking about that sexual history um, and whether that time frame sort of fits if possible. Um, we will see a bit of salmonella in people with sickle cell, um, much less likely obviously in the UK and pseudomonas in our trauma or puncture wound patients. So it's possible um, that if you've got someone with, especially with high grade trauma or puncture wounds um, that they might have a pseudomonas infection. Now, that's not necessarily important for us to understand but it is interesting in a couple of those areas like I mentioned um, especially with the streptococcus pneumonia um, and also the gonorrhea that, that is something that we might need to ask of our patients um, in their history um, in over the previous, like I say, couple of weeks before the onset of their symptoms. Um, and, and those are the kind of things that are going to cause um, the infection of the joint. So where is it most likely to occur? So it, as we already sort of mentioned, um, the knee is the most likely place. And then the second most likely place being the hip. Um, so those sort of large weight bearing joints um, are most commonly affected by septic arthritis. And then we will see it in other areas of the body. It might even be the shoulder or the elbow, um, if possible, um, but they're much lower numbers um, than, um, than the large joints, unless they've had a specific issue occur to them. Um, so, you know, if you've had um, open fracture near the elbow, for example, um, then it's possible that that could cause an infective arthritis. Prosthetic joints are commonly infected, um, and this can happen via a couple of routes. Um, one, they get infected during or immediately after the surgery. That's pretty uncommon in the UK. Infective practices are pretty good, uh, extremely good. <laughs> Shouldn't, we shouldn't write that off, should we? Extremely good, very low numbers of infected joints part, pass, uh, post prosthetics. Much more likely if it's traumatic, um, required after a, some sort of trauma. Um, because obviously they tend to be dirtier injuries anyway, um, but um, also in in um, people with lowered immune systems, it's possible that they might get an infection um, afterwards. Um, but then also again in those people when they have um, staphylococcus or streptococcus infections, um, then that might transmit to a prosthetic joint. Um, and the history of that can stretch out much longer. So the pros the prosthesis can be in a, have been around for quite a long time, multiple years, and then become infected. So it's not something that you think you can sort of write off because they didn't get infected immediately after the surgery. Um, the prosthetic joint itself is a risk factor for developing the infection um, at a later date. Um, the sternoclavicular joint and sacroiliac joints are locations that can get become infected uh, with IV drug users. Um, and I've seen a couple of these um, sacroiliac joint ones um, with IV drug users in the past. Uh, really red hot, angry sac um, sternoclavicular joint, sorry, um, infection. Um, and you 
you're not missing it it's, pre it's pretty obvious um but um that's something to be looking out for in iv drug users and obviously they do have a very high risk of infection so you want to have a low threshold for suspicion in those kinds of patients so remember i said about cohorts of people more likely to get infected joints um, those are quite high up the list and then previously damaged joints, something like rheumatoid arthritis, they've got erosive rheumatoid arthritis, especially of those large joints, then they are more likely to become infected. Um, and so again, watching out in that cohort for a sudden onset of this um, infection in the joint. So don't just be writing off the fact that, oh, they've got red hot swollen joint, that must be to do with their inflammatory arthritis. If it's very red, very hot, very angry, if the patient's saying it's different to what it normally is, or they've recently been unwell, so again, think about the pneumonia um, aspect of it, or even in young patients with very erosive arthritis, which still happens, um, if they're sexually active, is there something in that history that might have occurred, or have they had some sort of puncture wound or injury um, near recently that might have allowed um, an in it, the entry of the infection and and gone on to cause that infected joint so um, the other thing with those people is they are often immunocompromised with the drugs that they take so you have this sort of cascade of possibility that increases the likelihood of that septic arthritis so we just want to be keeping our minds open in those kinds of patients particularly the iv drug users particularly the joint damaged joint patients and particularly those with those prosthetic joints So obviously, lots of things cause a red, hot, swollen joint. So if you've got an acute onset of pain, redness, swelling, and heat, you've got a whole laundry list of things that can cause that. For one, ACL ruptures, for example, uh, fractures, as we're talking about infections, rheumatoid arthritis, other types of arthritis, um, we can get um, that kind of symptom. So it's not a particularly specific set of symptoms, Obviously, we've talked a little bit about history, but of course, people might not know they've had an infection, let's say for gonorrhea. They may not know that they've got caught gonorrhea or something similar um, and or, or don't divulge it. Possible. Um, so, oh, yes, we've got this very angry joint, but that's not the only thing that's going to be able to help us with some clinical reasoning. Um, so typically what we're going to be looking out for is systemic features of unwellness or infection as well so fever um, obviously a high temperature is likely to be caused by um, a an infection tachycardia or decreased appetite as well so if you've got someone with that red hot swollen joint um, then it is worth um, taking their um, doing the pulse oximeter or something similar or taking their pulse rate and seeing if they've got a particularly high um, high rate if you've been in a, an acute hospital any time recently um, then there are big signs everywhere that say don't miss sepsis um, and one of the ways that they do that is to take everyone's heart rate um, you can have a slightly raised tachycardia with an infection and not really sort of notice that uh, particularly um, strongly if it's sort of 100 110 120 maybe then you're not necessarily going to report that or notice that um, and decreased appetite obviously can be caused by plenty of things but in the context of an acute onset single red hot swollen joint um, then we're going to increase our suspicion for that septic arthritis so what we're doing really is we're bringing this um, set of symptoms and set of circumstances together to make a decision that we need this further investigated so for example we're going to see the acute onset red hot swollen joint large joint knee maybe it's prosthetic they've also got tachycardia um, and you go okay that's a number of things I'm, I'm a bit concerned that this might be um, might be infective so I'm going to send it to orthopedics see if they what they think um, and if and rule out the infection and then if it's not the infection then we're going to go for other things so this is the most clinically um, important diagnosis at the time and then once it's ruled out we can go clinically reasoning for other things commonly what i see um, people is <coughs> discussing the difference between septic arthritis and gout so obviously with gout you'll get an acute onset pain redness swelling and heat but you won't typically get um, a fever tachycardia or a decreased appetite um, so that can help distinguish 
Um, and that's what we're really looking for is one of those other signs, unless you've got some other you know, IV drug use as the, is, the, is the prime example. Uh, but unless you've got some other specific suspicion, then as we mentioned, it is very rare. So it is going to be on a differential diagnosis list, but we're not going to be sending tons of people to orthopedics um, without a few of those thresholds met for us. Um, and typically what I advise is if septic arthritis is something that's coming onto your radar as a differential diagnosis in an individual, then we're going to have a clinical discussion with another colleague um, before we make any major decisions about sending them to A&E um, or orthopedics directly. Um, make sure we're finding the set of symptoms, specifically the fever, the tachycardia and the decrease or and or the decreased appetite. Um, that gives us the systemic unwellness with some sort of vector um, for causing an infection and then away we go. So what do we do when we think it is septic? Off we go, urgent referral to orthopedics for synovial fluid analysis. So they'll tap the knee, um, find out what's in there and um, decide one, whether it is an infective co cause, and two, uh, what is it, it is infected with, and then treat it therefore accordingly. Um, if it's not infected, or whatever reason, work out whether there's another differential diagnosis that needs immediately dealing with. If there isn't, they're probably going to bounce them back to you. Absolutely fine, you can deal with it from there. If we are getting bloods, <coughs> they're typically going to get a white blood cell count, ESR and CRP. Um, and they're going to obviously be raised with the presence of white blood cells um, and inflammation. But for us as musculoskeletal therapists, <coughs> pardon me, the main thing is to get that patient to orthopedics. Um, and you probably, what I would suggest, and I suggest this with most pathway um, responses, is understand what the pathway is um, local to you so that you know what to do and you don't have to go scrambling around when you actually have an infected knee or joint um, with you in clinic what is the pathway how do you get them there do you need to ring a and e and say you're sending them do you need to send them with a letter do you ring orthopedics on call orthopedics registrar that kind of question um, so you know what you're doing with that pathway i think that's really good practice prior to um, requiring to need that referral onwards so that brings us um, in 23 minutes, in pretty much, um, round the content that I have for you today. That is an introduction to septic arthritis. We will have those some questions in the Q&A function. My friend Tim here has asked whether there has be, is there going to be any handouts. Tim, if you buy something from the shop, I'll happily send you the slide deck for this um, presentation no i'm only joking if anybody does want the um want the slide deck for this then um i'm sure we can uh, we can get that to you <coughs> um it will be on a youtube as well of course um, but if i'll work out a way of posting the uh posting the slide deck for you tim in fact i've got a way of doing it if you um if if we um can make my way onto substack then i'll host the slide deck on there um, <clears throat> okay, so top question here with three votes. It's just beaten out Tim's um, Tim's handout one, which I'm going to get rid of there. Joanne Avery's asked, is discitis a type of septic arthritis or is this just inflammation? Equally a medical emergency. So Joanne, discitis is inflammation of the disc or the intervertebral disc. And that can be caused by an infection. So some types of discitis would be septic arthritis. Uh, typically, because it's not a joint, it would be septic discitis. Um, <clears throat> but it's a similar sort of process. Um, some uh, we've seen in recent years an increase in spinal TB in, um, in London specifically. Um, and there are obviously other types of infection that can get in there. Yes, I would deem that a medical emergency. 
there are some chronic types of discitis, but if I'm honest, I'm not messing around with trying to differentially diagnose that. If someone comes back, probably on an MRI, I'm guessing, unless you unless they're systemically unwell, if you've gotten in them an MRI and it comes back showing discitis, I'm asking orthopedics to have a look at that um, before I go doing anything else, particularly um, with that kind of post person. Um, I not I don't know whether it, it is a med. It's hard, isn't it? Is it a medical? It's not. It's not blue lighting someone to accident an emergency uh, medical emergency, but it is. It is a red flag for us in musculoskeletal therapies. So I'd be getting orthopedics to have a look at them. Um, and again, you, what's the spinal pathway? Um, and we'll get that um, dealt with under orthopedics. Um, but of other types of arthritis can cause um, discitis as well. So the discitis part, just to recover that briefly, discitis is inflammation of the intervertebral disc, and then it's what is causing that. So sometimes it would be infective, so septic. Other times it would be inflammatory, auto autoimmune, for example. Um, <coughs> Tracy has asked, is there any way... To screen patients who could be at increased risk of developing septic arthritis post steroid injection into a large joint of the knee. So, Tracy, it would be um, basically the, the um, uh, predisposing factors that we mentioned. Um, so, if it's, it seems unlikely to me that you're in, you're steroid injecting a, a IV drug user, but that, that's the example. Um, if they have a high risk of infection generally, so immunocompromised IV drug user, the joint is already replaced, unlikely to be injecting a, a steroid, but possible. Or they've got very damaged joints from arthritis or some other trauma, um, then those would increase their risk of the septic arthritis. But it's still, like I say, it's still very low numbers. So you would be screening them for those likelihood of getting an infection um, and then and going from there. And if you deem them a high risk of infection, you probably wouldn't be injecting their, their knee. Um, I say this from someone who doesn't inject, um, so it's a little bit easier for me to say rather than when someone sat in front of me with waiting for a knee injection. Um, but um, those are the kinds of processes that I would go through, if that makes sense. Um, Laura asks, <coughs> have I seen septic non-synovial joints, for example, the pubic, pubic synthesis after invasives, e.g. surgery or steroid injections? I haven't um, seen it, but there's no reason why they couldn't become infected. What I would suspect you would see if it's non-synovial is you're going to see a more general um, sort of infection so it's going to be in the soft tissues as well so it's not going to be housed within that synovium um, because it's not going to have that same homeostasis but there's no reason why you couldn't get the infection there um, the other thing i've seen as well is for post fracture is <coughs> getting sort of osteomyelitis that's sort of within the joint um so it's because of where the where the synovium wraps around sort of where the osteomyelitis is so definitely wouldn't rule it out because it's non-synovial. Um, but I, you, as you've sort of alluded to, you're going to have that obvious vector where they've had um, an invasive something or other. It's going to be nearby. It's, I wouldn't, it would, it would be weird. It seems a weird jump to me to think, you know, you, let's say you had ankle surgery, for example, and then you've got a pubis, pubic synthesis infection. I don't think so. I think you're more likely to get it from local, locally. Um, so you're going to have that sort of vector, if that makes sense. But you're still looking for the same type of symptoms. <coughs> um, so Josh has asked, would you... Um, should read these before I start uh, start reading them out on air. Okay, so I don't know the answer, shouldn't I? Uh, would you rely heavily on those systemic features to decide whether to send to orthos? I find it tricky not to just refer straight through if dealing with an acute hot, spoiled, and painful joint. I get differentiating between gout, uh, septic, but I'd leave that to orthos. <clears throat> so there are other um, differentiating factors. Really, you're looking for the um, you're, you're looking for the, the the suspicion, and gout is wildly much more so you're looking at you know gout you're looking at one in 14 men are likely to get gout in their lifetime one in 35 women um so comparative to that to two to six out of um a hundred thousand so most of the time it's if you know you you're differentiating as you've mentioned between gout and septic arthritis um but you, you i'm not really going to be referring everything from 
through to um to orthopedics just because it's red hot and swollen um obviously you're looking here we're talking the reason that we, you're talking differentiating it between gout and septic is because of its single joint nature so if it's multi-joint you're just likely to think it's, more, it's rheumatological much more likely to be rheumatological so um the, you're, you're not likely to be referring that as well so yes i ref rely heavily on outside of okay okay let's just walk that back slightly outside of the obvious infective risk iv drug user for, as an example um then i would rely heavily on if there's no systemic factors um occurring now obviously again we're going to be looking at this through a clinical lens so if it's deteriorating that is uh, another um, kettle of fish entirely um so you have to take the patient obviously in, in context if it is deteriorating um then you're likely to think that something's going on that is non-musculoskeletal um whereas if it's if it is for example gout we want to keep that in primary care really you don't really need that to go to to accident and emergency um so it, and again it, it, and it depends on your experience level you know i i've seen a, a lot probably more red hot swollen joints than the most uh when i was working in rheumatology so you do get a feeling for those kinds of um that you know what is what's caused by what um but um uh, if you're if you're not uh, confident on that then by all means referring out but I, I i like the clinical conversation with with another colleague as well bounce the ideas off see what they think um but really yeah like i say systemic features it's quite commonly is the tachycardia unless they're really unwell and it's obvious they will have a low grade uh, tachycardia alongside the joint infection um last couple of questions um allison's asked what the rate of septic arthritis post steroid injection i don't know that specifically allison actually um i would suspect it's pretty low post a steroid injection specifically obviously it's possible um but with a septic technique a septic <laughs> not a septic technique don't use a septic use an aseptic technique um then you should have a pretty low rate of septic arthritis with a steroid injection there are obviously other issues related to steroid injections with regards chucking them in a joint um but the actual septic arthritis and like i say unless they are particularly immunocompromised or there's some other likelihood higher risk of infection then um it's not going to be um massively um high um and then reedy's got asked two questions here which i'll lump together together what what's the physio treatment after the infection sorted and what might be the residual symptoms so if we're talking about inflammatory symptoms so the pain redness heat and swelling those should all completely resolve once the infection is cured result removed um so you take the antibiotics as a simple answer that should all disappear so those symptoms you should have you should have no symptoms re remaining after the infection is cleared now what uh, what can happen is obviously if it's extremely severe or it lasts for any period of time is you might get loss of function um, particularly range of motion strength etc and those would need addressing building back up again um, with uh, physio or osteo or gyro or whoever is best off seeing that patient um, if there is joint destruction uh, which again as we mentioned that is possible um, then again it's about functionally managing that person possibly you might need to help them offload um, the joint um, in the short term and then build up their load tolerance um, if the joint structure itself has changed so um, again a simple um, example might be they've developed a, jo a varus joint or a valgus joint and that might need building up tolerance to um, to load so usually it's functional restoration uh, but you should be um you shouldn't be left with lots and lots of pain redness sweet swelling etc that should be resolved um so lovely stuff i'm just gonna check the oh laura's answered here great thanks laura um oh my goodness okay post steroid injections about one in three hundred thousand so pretty <laughs> that's pretty low pretty low numbers um great answer thanks laura i don't again don't inject so uh so that number is not on the top of my tongue but that's quite a lot it's quite a, if you do a th three hundred thousand injections in your career you're doing pretty well um you're doing pretty well thank you laura for that answer there 
Um, wonderful stuff. Thank you, everybody, this evening for joining me for the webinar. Um, I would like to direct you to some of my other resources, as I've already mentioned. YouTube, um, this is about, I think it's about seventh of these types of webinars that I've done now. So there's a list of those on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm obviously on social media, um, rheumatology, physio, or pretty much everywhere. I have this new Substack. Um, so if you type rheumatologyphysio.substack, uh, dot com um, then that you can join there that starts from monday um, and that will be emails into your inbox with different cbd materials that i've created um, and blogs and podcasts and that kind of stuff so you're going to email that directly and then i do courses as well so i do everything from um, a couple of hours to full day courses um, which you can find on my website rheumatology.physio forward slash courses which is imaginative um, web address. But thank you very much for everybody for being here. Hopefully I'll see you out some more of these. There'll be another one of these. It'll be uh, in the last week of, ne of February. I haven't booked it yet. Probably Tuesday again. It's a good day. Tuesday's a good. Um, and um, I, don't, I haven't got a topic for that yet. So if anybody's got any topics, then, uh, then feel free to send them through social media, email, whatever you fancy. Um, and I'll see you soon. Bye for now, everybody. Bye.